Okay, welcome. This is the Miami Dade Chamber of Commerce, and it is Black Her Story Month. Yeah, you heard me right. I said it's Black Her Story Month, and I am so excited about today. But let let me tell you about how we came to today. Um, 2021, here we are and still in, I would say, in the middle of the pandemic. Last year, during our gala, we honored uh, four gentlemen, and I'm just being transparent. One of my board members said, wait a minute, we didn't honor any women. So to make sure that I was in good stead with my board, we made a decision to declare that 2021 is the year of the woman. So every event that we are doing, we are honoring women and recognizing women in the community. With that, I want to take this opportunity to introduce our sponsor of today. Baptist Hospital has been so kind and gracious to be the sponsor as we bring Black Her Story Month to you today. I want to introduce you to Dr. Yvonne Johnson, Chief Medical Officer, South Miami Hospital. Dr. Johnson is currently the Chief Medical Officer of South Miami Hospital, part of the Baptist Health South Florida. Originally from New Jersey, Dr. Johnson is a graduate of Harvard University and Howard University College of Medicine. She completed her residency at Jackson Memorial Hospital, University of Miami. A leading speaker, both locally and internationally, Dr. Johnson has given numerous lectures on the topic of women and heart disease. She also serves as a clinical assistant professor of the Florida International University, Herbert Weinstein College of Medicine. Dr. Yvonne, and also I must say a friend. So good to have you here today. Thank you, Eric, and I'm very honored to be here. Good afternoon. On behalf of Baptist Health South Florida, the proud sponsor of the Miami-Dade Chamber of Commerce celebration of Black History Month, it is my pleasure to welcome you to her story. I am particularly honored and humbled to provide the welcome knowing the women whose stories are being celebrated today in honor of Black History Month. I love February. It is my favorite month of the year for several reasons. First, February starts with my birthday. Second, February is heart month. And as an emergency medicine doctor, I always take the opportunity to remind folks that heart disease is the number one killer of Americans, including women. And at Baptist Health, we want to make sure that even during a pandemic, you remember to continue to seek routine preventative care with your physicians and not to delay emergency care out of fear of coronavirus. I promise we will provide you care, not give you COVID. But most importantly, February is my favorite month because growing up, it was the only time we learned about African-American history even though it is an integral part of American history. It was February of second grade when I first read about my favorite Shiro, Harriet Tubman. Her bravery, commitment to others, and courage inspired me then and now. So I am honored to welcome you to a program that shares the commitment to community and the courage of the three Shiro's that we celebrate today. Dr. Dorothy Jenkins Fields, Thelma V. Gibson, and Ruth Schack. I am inspired by their life stories as well, and have been personally touched by at least two of these women whom I have known for many years. Each of these women is a pioneer in her own right. And like Harriet Tubman, each has served as an inspiration to others and as a catalyst for change that opened doors in our community for African-Americans and women like myself to walk through. They are the epitome of servant leaders, selflessly paving roads for others to walk and extend. 
Dr. Fields, Ms. Gibson, Ms. Shack, as a black woman physician, I will take a personal point of privilege to thank you for paving the road for me. And like my Shiro Harriet Tubman, thank you for turning around on your spectacular journeys and reaching your hands back to propel so many of your people forward. Baptist Health salutes you. It is now my privilege and my honor to introduce to you tonight's moderator, MC, woman extraordinaire, the Miami-Dade Chamber Chair-Elect, the Women's Business Council's Chairwoman, an all-around go-getter. Don't stand in her way because she will run you over because she got business to do. The um, one of the vice president of Henderson Financial Group, my friend, uh, we go back a few days and it's, I'm so proud to have her be the moderator because um, she's going to be one day the woman that you talk about her story as we talk with Ruth Shack, Merlene, uh, excuse me, Ruth Shack, uh, Dr. Dorothy Jenkins Fields, and Miss Thelma Gibson. So I'm going to get out of the way and turn it over to Miss Linda Harris. Thank you so very much, Eric. Thank you so much. I am so happy to be here. You know, prior to us going live, I was sharing with everyone that I am a native Miamian. I am the original 305 or one of them. I was in um, Miami Gardens when it was called Opalaka. I just learned that that district was a former commissioner Ruth Shack's district. I grew up with these ladies listening, watching, learning about, did you hear about this? Did, girl, do you know what Dr. Jenkins said? Oh, can you believe what Thelma I was, I, I was on the sideline, I witnessed it. So this event, thank you so much, uh, South Miami Hospital, which is part of Baptist Health. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, ladies, we truly stand on your shoulders. We really, really do. You ladies, were, I don't know if you realize, and this is something I want to ask. Let's just, let's just get right into it. When we talk about now, ladies saying, I want to have it all. You ladies were doing it all before we coined that phrase. Mothers, wives, aunts, trailblazers, history makers. I want to start with you, Miss Ruth Shag. Did you know that, were you trying to have it all or did this just happen to you? I want to know how you managed to do it all when that's right now the it phrase now having it all or should we even want to have it all ruth you have to take your mute off you're muted gotcha 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 now no that was me um ruth you have to unmute yourself you're still muted there I am you go. no longer muted. And I will no, no, you. <laughs> That's an outrage. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was trying to say before someone cut me off that I am thrilled to be here and so honored to be with uh, two women who I matured with in, in Miami. <laughs> Uh, it seemed every time I was someplace, I looked over my shoulder and, and they were right there. Uh, it's been uh, really an extraordinary experience to have, as I say, matured. We, my husband and I came down on a honeymoon and stayed in Miami for 63 years. Uh, and we've been through six different Miamis. Um, and I grew up afraid that someone was going to do something without me. <laughs> that, that was my motivation for being in the middle of it. Uh, that's the answer to your question. <laughs> How about you, Mrs. Gibson? Were you trying to have it all? Because you certainly were doing it all. Um, mother, wife, trailblazer. 
Mrs. Gibson, were you trying to have it all, or do you think we can at least? Does that not even exist? Not, not at all. all. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. I didn't want it all. I just wanted my small piece and the mm. piece for my community. Mm -hmm. so because of that, I felt that I needed to get out there and do whatever it is that God would have me do. You know, I always tell everybody that I just wanted the best for this little community called Coconut mm -hmm. Grove mm -hmm. because I know how it was started by the Bahamians who mm -hmm. came here mm -hmm. and dug it out and uh, gave us this little piece of land that colored people, we were colored back in my day. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Dink, Dr. Fields don't like to hear me say that because I'm always <laughs> correcting everybody about the fact mm -hmm. that we didn't get to be black until the 1970s. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in the 80s, we became African-Americans. And I'm so proud of you young people and what you're doing mm -hmm. because you were the ones who told us that black is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And because uh, we had been Negroes or colored for so long. And uh, I just want a little piece of the pie and mm -hmm. share it, share it with everybody else who enjoys, wow. uh, so they can enjoy some of what this world has to offer. Wow, Dr. Dorothy G Fields Jenkins, um, did you want it all? Did you plan this? Did you plan on all of these accolades? <laughs> and did you plan on starting the, the 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 lyric theater and being responsible and the woman behind it? You have two beautiful doors. Did you plan this life or did it just unfold? Uh, plan? No, not at all. I uh, was looking for the history, even okay. though I was okay. a school librarian, I expected that uh, there were some books that had been written about Blacks that I just mm -hmm. hadn't known about. And so I made a phone call thinking mm -hmm. that I would get 15 or 20 books Mm -hmm. about Blacks in Miami. And uh, when I asked the downtown librarian, she said, we only have a folder with obituaries about Black people. Yes, wow. that's wow. what I said. And I said, why? And the answer she gave changed my life and the life of this community as it relates to Black history. And her answer was, I guess those people haven't thought enough of themselves to what? write their history. Really? She didn't say it with any malice. She just uh -huh. said it as a matter of fact. Uh -huh. And of course, I was livid. I was just in shock. And, uh, but I could not prove her wrong. Uh, and, and, and that's how my journey started uh -huh. in 1974. Wow. You know, ladies, I always say, if you want to impress me, do what you ladies did in the condition in which you did it in, in the circumstances and under the circumstances in which you did it in. Because back then there was no hashtag me too. There was no discussion about gender inequality or if it was, it wasn't mainstream. There was no discussion and, and trying to do something about systemic racism. You just did it in those conditions. So my, my question is, you know, did you, I know you had to run into some resistance. How did you feel like you can keep going? Cause I tell you now, I'm doing so many things and I'm not even a mother, I'm a other, you know, auntie and godmother. I don't know God. And, and so people are now medicating, anxiety is set in. You ladies just did it. So my main question is under all of those circumstances, a, was there pushback? And B, how did you push through it? And I'll start again in rotation with you, Ms. Shack. Well, I, <laughs> I love to tell the story about okay. when other little four-year-old girls wanted to be Shirley Temple. Uh -huh. I wanted to be on the radio convincing people of things that needed to be done. And wow. course, those years, girls were not politicians. Right. When I discovered what politicians were, I decided I would marry one. Uh, I married a perfectly wonderful man who had no interest at all in politics. <laughs> so I had to move out of the office, stuffing envelopes, raising money, and walking the streets for other people and run myself. And wow. uh, it was a very heady experience, let me tell you. Uh, and people kept saying, why aren't you home taking care of your children? 
I can imagine. Now, Ms. Shaq, you were responsible for uh, assisting a lot of females um, and getting them into office. And even even back then, a lot of our, our uh, pioneer female politicians, you were behind a lot of them. And but so there's a lot of work to be done. There was a lot of work that women did unacknowledged, unacknowledged. and uh, unknown, unfortunately. Uh, and I don't think there is a male politician who did not have a phalanx of women behind him. Wow. As a stuffing uh, envelope mailing uh, campaigning for them. And so there was a point at which it was uh, appropriate for mm -hmm. me to just get up and do it. You were ahead of your time. You were fighting for LGBT rights. You were yes. back then, you were fighting I, for women's I, rights. I, I come from a, a Jewish, I am Jewish. I come from an anti-Semitic uh, experience gotcha. Gotcha. growing up through that. Mm -hmm. Got to Miami in time to become a part of the civil rights when, um, you know, Jim Crow was still king of the mountain in Miami. Right. Right. Uh, I became a part of the women's movement. We used the same tactics, the same skills mm -hmm. that uh, were perfected in the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And then when I realized there was another group of people who were being discriminated against, it didn't make sense. And so uh, I was out there doing the same thing for a new group work. of people. And it, it finally came to fruition. And we thank you and we thank you and we're glad you, you, you didn't give up. Mrs. Gibson, how did you get through it and push through it? How, how did you get yeah, no hashtag me too, no uh, women's inequality, top conversations. Um, people were looking at women totally at, like uh, Ms. Shaq just said, why aren't you home taking care of the children? You had a career. Now, first of all, let's clear this up. There's a rumor out there, Ms. Gibson, that you were the first <laughs> black nurse at Jackson Hospital. Is that true? <laughs> and that is not true. Okay. I, I have to tell that all the time that I was not the first color nurse back at Jackson Hospital. When okay. I got there in 1947, mm -hmm. there were at least 10 other colored nurses. Okay. And, but we had to work on the colored floors. Mm. I came with the thought that I was going to work in the operating room. Mm -hmm. They had hired me. I had my letter in my hand and I got there and I said, I'm Delma Anderson and I'm here for my job in the operating room. Mm -hmm. And they said, uh, 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 Nurse Anderson, you can't work in the operating room, but if you work what? on the colored floors and get some experience, maybe one day you'll work in the operating room. They didn't have the nerve to tell me that I would probably never work in the operating room because of segregation. Mm -hmm. so, I thought I wouldn't take that job, but I came home and I told mama, mama, you know, I can't work at Jackson because I can't work in that pretty room. She said, girl, you got to work. Well, you better go work there and make the best of it. And so I remembered that, you know, I could do something there at Jackson. Mm -hmm. I went there and there were Miss Pace and Miss Holden and okay. Ms. Hutchinson, oh, and Ms. E, Ms. Grace, uh, you know, Grace Higgs was with the health department, but Carey, Miss Carey, all mm -hmm. of them were there before I got there. And I got there and they were on the colored floors. They uh -huh. were calling patients by their first name and calling colored nurses nurse while they called the white nurses Miss or Mrs. Mm -hmm. So that was my wow. fight. That's when I started a battle. And I said to them, you know, I'm not gonna call myself nurse. And I'd answer the phone and say, colored one, Miss Anderson. Somebody would come over and say, uh, uh, nurse Anderson, you know, you're supposed to say nurse. I say, I said, you can call me what you want to call me, but I'm going to be Miss Anderson. I'm going to call myself Miss Anderson. And the young people who came to work with us, the young men from Jackson, uh, my book at Washington High School, I said, we're going to respect ourselves and we're going to respect our patients. So we're going to call all our patients Mr. and Mrs. And we're going to call these other colored nurses nurse. Well, the colored nurses would say to me, girl, you're going to get fired. What's wrong with being what? colored nurse? You are a nurse. Right. I say, yeah, I say, yeah I'm a nurse by training. But I 
am also a young lady that when I got to St. Agnes School of Nursing back in 1944, mm -hmm. I was 17 years old and they said, started calling me Miss Anderson. And so then I thought I was somebody on I really <laughs> thought I was grown, grown up and all that. So I wasn't about to let anybody keep me from calling myself Miss Anderson. And so this is how it all started. And I you know, had to work through that. And I, I worked in, I went to Washington, D.C. The same thing, I couldn't work in the operating room in 1950 in the District of what? Columbia. No, you could not. We were still separated to the point that you couldn't even go to the theater without it being up in the balcony in North Carolina. So I sit here telling you the fight has not been easy, but it's been a rewarding one. Uh -huh. And when I think of, uh, I go back to my childhood days when people like Dorothy Jenkins, Phil's mother, who was Dorothy Johnson, was uh -huh. my Girl Scout leader. And okay. one of the things I always remember is Miss Johnson then, I always tell Dorothy that she took her mother away from us because when she got pregnant with Dorothy, <laughs> she didn't have Carver, she didn't have to go to Grove training school for color, but she was our Girl Scout leader. And I took that oath back then. And I had to serve God in my country. And Amen. I just felt that I had to serve people. And she taught us so much about service that it just kept me going. And I think that you just continue to go knowing that a better day is going to come one day. Absolutely. Even so, back then, I hear you saying, I wasn't going to take that. I wasn't going to call myself that. Where did that come from? You, from what I understand, you're one of 14 children. I am one of 14. In fact, 11 lived. <laughs> <laughs> so you, 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 was there, did that help you stand up for yourself? Because I'm one of seven and I'm a middle child and I had to fight for my little, my, my yeah. right to speak. <laughs> you had to always fight for your marbles and everything right, else. Right. And your right to place in the, in the, in there. But, but, but I was always like the second mama. Because wow. I, I was always my little brother. I had a baby brother who was only eight months old when I came home from nursing school. What? And one, one who was three and one five. And you know, I used to take them everywhere. And everybody thought they were my children. And I discovered that uh, I had to take care of them as if I was the mom. Gotcha. And it was amazing what had happened <laughs> uh, during those times. Did you find your way? And they, yeah. They, yeah. they respected me. <laughs> so, but they were glad to go everywhere with me. And it was just a wonderful uh, experience for me. Wow. Dr. Dorothy Jenkins Fields, Spelman graduate, Miami girl, raised in Overtown. How did you push through? There was no Me Too back then. You, you're going and you're interviewing people to, to make sure we keep our history and archive us. And, and after being told there was a folder, something in you said, oh, heck no. We need to document our history. What, what was that? Were you from a big family as well? No, I'm actually an only child, but my mother's family uh, and my mother was uh, Thelma's um, Girl Scout leader. Right. Uh, and um, my, well, they start when I was born, my mother, her two sisters and four brothers were all college graduates. Wow. Before the end of World War II. Wow. Yes. That's quite an accomplishment. That's, in, a, that's in, a, in, in, in color town, over yeah. town. Yes. 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 And so uh, it was already set that mm -hmm. uh, education was paramount for all of us. Wow. It appears that my grandmother of, of Bahamian ancestry uh, always wanted her children to have an education. Okay. Yes. And uh, so it was important that, uh, that we do what we needed to do in order to educate ourselves and to educate our families. When I, and I would hear their stories, it was their stories growing up that I hated. Oh no, they would repeat the same stories over and over again. I had no idea it was those individual and collective stories that would one day uh, uh, encourage me to, uh, to document and to mm -hmm. record and to make it available, not just their stories, but the community stories. So we could tell our own uh, without other people interpreting for us. And so I was, uh, 
um, interested and went to Emory University and got certification in archives administration. Okay. And uh, as a part of that graduate course, you know, when you have a graduate course, you always have to write a paper. Right. And when I told them that I was uh, actually worked for the school board as a school librarian, mm -hmm. that I had two babies, two young girls uh, that I had uh, brought with me uh, to Atlanta. My mother came with me. Okay. And uh, so that they could get experience and be on Spelman's campus. Uh, oh, wow. And I had a then husband <laughs> in law school. So uh, I knew that uh, I could not leave my job to start an organization. So they uh, at Emory suggested that I write a paper mm -hmm. on the development of the black photographic archives. I was uh, gonna collect pictures. And uh, I did that, came mm -hmm. back and uh, told the people at the school board, they said, well, you know, you work, you, there's nothing, you, you, you'll have to do that, do that on your own time. Uh, and uh, we'll, we're giving you two years to write a book because the bicentennial is coming. Okay. So two days a week, you have to, you could do research uh, on women because I was working with uh, Ruth Braddock, who was then chair of the history uh, committee for the American Association of University Women. And they were threatening with Ruth Shack and uh, Marie Anderson and many mm -hmm. others to mm -hmm. write a book. It was a threat what? Uh, because no book had ever been written. And the men in the academy, mm -hmm. who, men in the, uh, at the universities were saying, oh no, what do you need a book about women for? What? That's, that's not important. Oh, they actually what? said it to us. <laughs> it just sounds so... Uh... <laughs> Archaic, I know. <laughs> Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Wow. And one place where there was a library that we could have gone to um, closed on Sundays after we started because they said we didn't need that. We don't you don't need that. So we started meeting at uh, Audrey Finkelstein's home uh, mm -hmm. in uh, in the Gables. Uh, at that time, I would uh, go through the back door uh, because I couldn't even go through her front door. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. but would go there every Sunday mm -hmm. and uh, uh, start gathering material because we were determined that there should be a book about women. It took us about 10 years, but we got it. The bicentennial was in 76. We started in 74. By 1980, we got it published. And it's called Julia's Daughters. Mm -hmm. Have you seen it? Have you read it? There's a no, copy in there's a copy in your library, your okay. in the Opalaka Library and in the school library. Okay. Yes, it's worth your reading. Wow. And I would encourage you. Where'd your name audience. come from, Julia's daughter? Surprise, surprise, from <laughs> Julia Tuttle. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yes. That's in the causeway. Oh yes, my goodness. In the causeway. You are dropping some knowledge here. You're dropping a lot of knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> and you Which is one of the things is that we bonded. We started working together. I didn't know Ruth. I knew Thelma because uh, she's our cousin. And uh, on Sunday, sometimes we would catch the bus mm -hmm. and uh, go to Coconut Grove. Mm -hmm. And I thought only Black people lived in Coconut Grove. I didn't know white people lived in Coconut Grove. Because <laughs> we, <only, laughs> we only went to their house. She and Maxine. Right, Davies, we just went to visit them. Uh, but it was, it was an opportunity for us to, to work together. Um, and so with uh, Ruth Shack and uh, Arva Moore Parks, with mm -hmm. Dolly McIntyre, mm -hmm. uh, with the uh, retired librarians from University of Miami, uh, we were determined to put it together now with two babies right. uh, and a husband in law school. Um, uh, Sundays was the time that I was supposed to cook and get the laundry and everything. So mm -hmm. I said to my mother, well, what am I gonna do? So my mother said, being the supportive uh, person that she was uh, right. along with my aunts, she said, but I tell you what you do between our home in Brownsville and uh, um, Audrey Finkelstein's home in Carl Gables, 
find uh, a washer terrier, find a place that will wash clothes. Uh -huh. And I'll, I'll pay for it. So on your, take all your dirty clothes and on your way <laughs> to uh, the meeting, leave the clothes, have them wash, dry and fold. Uh, so my aunt Elaine Adderley, mm -hmm. who was a, uh, a teacher, a home economics teacher at Booker T said, well, get a Chuck steak and uh, get uh, onion, uh, onion sauce and uh, put it over the raw steak, mm -hmm. uh, tie it up very well with foil, mm -hmm. put it in the oven and put it on 200 and put some vegetables, uh, frozen vegetables around it. So when you get home, uh, dinner will be cooked and the clothes will be washed and ready. And the children wow. live next door to my mother. So, uh, so you figured it out. You yes. did it. You figured it out. <laughs> yes. Now on that note, there's a myth. Um, and even it, it, it's to this day, to 2021 ladies, and I, and I want your help with this. There's a myth that we women can't work together. There's a myth that we don't get along. Now, personally, for me, every diva I know, we work well together. I, I, or, or you just won't be in my circle. But I do recognize that that there is some that don't get along. I want to know how it was for you back going in our rotation root shack. Did you find it difficult to work with other women? Did you have to bring them along kicking and screaming? Was there that bitter jealousy no, and no, fighting? No, no, no. That's, <laughs> no? That's, a, that's, as you put it, a myth. That's okay. A, a dreadful story that was okay. reported from men because they didn't want us working together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, we were a threat to their power base. And so why would they invite us in if we could be home doing the laundry and cooking dinner for tonight? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, but women work beautifully together. But people would say to me when I was on the county commission, don't you want more women on the county commission? And I would say, I want more feminists. Ooh. I want more people, men and women, who believe in what it is I want to accomplish. Absolutely. That's right. um, we have to bring our men along, kicking and screaming, right. but they have to understand the value of women in a society. And, uh, and that, that was the fight that we were fighting way back then. Mm -hmm. uh, the first wave of feminists, the second wave of feminists. Uh, the beauty of living in Miami is that it's a work in progress. Okay. And okay. Uh, our having been there, my husband and I for 60 years, mm -hmm. we lived through at least six different Miamis. Wow. And would ask me what was my favorite. My favorite is what's coming next. Oh, I love that answer. You, Linda, and your colleagues, men and women, are going to fashion a world-class city because you have wow. all of the makings for it in this community. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I believe Ms. it. Ms. Gibson, what about you working with other women? Now, you come with working with your trailblazing husband, um, civil rights involvement. And very often we, we don't ask the women, how are you doing? You know, we're right there beside our men. Um, of course, the men are in danger, especially again in that, in that era and taking the stands that men and women did back then. And very often we don't ask you how you're doing. So how, how were you and did other women help you or did you find the, the pettiness, Mrs. Gibson? Oh, they were always, I, I, you know, I always worked with women pretty much because men didn't okay. become nurses until later on. So it was always women mm -hmm. and we always got along. And of course they were always trying to bring me along because they thought I was young and, you know, way out there because of all the things <laughs> that I would do and say, but they would follow me. And then eventually they began to realize that yes, we are. Uh, women who could work together and it changed me. And yet when I think of it, mm -hmm. back in 1947 up to 1949, and then again back in 51 to 55, I worked at Jackson mm -hmm. and I worked with all the women on all the floors and I went to all the floors. Um, the, the director of nursing was so tired of seeing me 
because they were always saying that she would send me to her saying she won't call herself nurse. And I said, well, you know, they could call me. And Miss, I used to always say to her, they could call me what they want. But I was taught in my nursing school that I was Miss Anderson. So that's why I, I say that over and over again. And so they were able to accept that. And then the colored nurses all began to call one another Miss and Mrs. Uh, when I think of people like Miss Hogan, and Miss Pace and Miss uh, Carey and that mm -hmm. lunch we were just so happy that I was there doing these kinds of things and th to make the patients feel so mm -hmm. comfortable knowing that we respected them as well. And, and, while, and while I couldn't work in the operating at Jackson in mm -hmm. 1984, Commissioner Carey uh, Shula appointed me to the uh, Public Health Trust and I served on the Public Health Trust uh, <laughs> Ms. Jack remembers some of those days when she was doing so much <laughs> for all of us at the foundation and uh, helping us to do what we needed to do, but was able to help other nurses to see that they could do some things to help change take place. Amen. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, I started the Women's Chamber of Commerce after I met with a group right. of women in Atlanta. Uh, where the women were doing so many great things. And I said, came back here and I called around and asked some of my friends, did we ever have a women's chamber of commerce? And they said, no, Thelma. And we've only had one chairman at that time mm -hmm. of the, of the uh, chamber of commerce. And they said, we could, you can start that if you want. And so that's how we got started. Got a group of 21 women, 12 blacks, 12 Hispanics and 12 whites. Mm -hmm. And they, we met in my home and talked about what we could be doing and to help change take place. And this is how the Women's Chamber of Commerce. So it was really 21 women who founded it. They always want to say I founded it, but there were 20 <laughs> about 20, 21 of us working together uh, to find that. Found so the women's and I always felt Congress. that we needed to have people respect the fact that women could do some things. And so I'm very proud of what's happened with the chamber because those women have really made change take place and got a lot of other people involved. Absolutely, uh, so absolutely. Makes, Dr. Makes Dorothy no Jenkins Fields, you have raised millions of dollars. You were relentless in getting that Lyric Theater. You mm -hmm. took no for not right now. You <laughs> took no for I'll be back. You mm -hmm. did not say, you, you, you did not give out or give up. So were women instrumental in that or did you find that any part of that myth that you didn't have women pushing you and on board and getting along with each other? Well, starting off with my mother and my grandmother who were just determined that uh, we had to make things better. Mm -hmm. um, I always came in contact with uh, women as we worked together on projects. Mm -hmm. Arbor Parks, again, I've mentioned Dolly McIntyre, especially with historic preservation. And it was Barbara Carey, who was commissioner at the time, mm -hmm. who appointed me to the uh, Metro Dade Historic Preservation Board uh, that helped to lift me up. And it was Ruth Shack who decided and whose uh, legislation we supported for uh, art in public places. Most people wow. don't realize that it's because of her. Wow. Initiative. Yes, I'm telling it all, Ruth. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> and so uh, I, I worked with women with uh, on projects like Arva and I with uh, mm -hmm. Miami, the Magic City, with the film. Okay. Uh, but then I worked with women who had their own projects, and I was just so pleased uh, Sunday to see uh, behind his article about Eunice Liberty because it was Mrs. Liberty yes. with the National Council of Negro Women who made yes. it possible for the Black Archives to have space at the Caleb wow. Center. Yes. Wow. And uh, so, and of course, um, Enid with uh, uh, the Hampton House. Hampton, okay. And so while we've had our individual projects, Elaine Black with uh, Tools for Change. Absolutely. Uh, you name it. Um, I, and I wanted to call some of the women, Barbara Capitman, a mm -hmm. name that you don't hear very uh -huh. un, enough. And uh, she was the one who really uh, got the first uh, 20th century uh, district for the National Trust, Miami Beach. Okay. Uh, and so we had our individual projects 
but whenever we needed to come together to go to the county commission, to the city commission, to the state, uh, it didn't matter. We'd get on the phone and call each other and we would storm down there. Lynn <laughs> Cherry is another one. Oh, uh, yes, yes. yes. I, yes. You would be surprised that I have wow. at my table, I asked uh, what questions were going to be asked because I have at my table mm -hmm. right now in front of mm -hmm. me, mm -hmm. a table full of uh, post-it notes with names of mm. women who have just been at the forefront. And so at some point, I'm gonna get a chance to share them with you so that you will, will know. Euphoria Frazier, a name that you don't wow. hear. Right. Uh, yes, yes. And it, the list goes on. Wow. This hour has gone hey. by. Mm -hmm. Yes, Ruth. Hey, sure. Before we go away, I, I'm doing a lot. I, I love reading. Uh, libraries are my best friends. And um, the more you read about history, particularly in the US, the more you realize every time a group of people created a town, a village, a city, whatever it was, it was the women who made the hospital happen. It was the women who insisted that they have a library. It was uh. the women who implemented the schools before uh. the public schools. So women have banded together recognizing that there were holes in our uh, mm -hmm. civilization and they had to fill them. Uh, it's at, and of course, Miami was founded by a woman. Wow. Yes. <laughs> this is what I mean. This is, this is deciding that her real estate was worth something. Let's get something going here. This is her story. This is, we are the Miami Dade Chamber of Commerce. Um, this is what we do. We absolutely love doing it. This hour is going by so fast, but I have one more question. One more for you ladies. Make so, it an easy one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's gonna be a good one. So one of the things, I, I don't care how old we get, how young we are. One of the things we get together and we talk about when we get amongst each other is men. That's, I mean, it's still one of my favorite topics. As a financial advisor, I've been in, uh, a stockbroker for about 25 years. Um, one of the biggest questions I get asked, and I'd love to know how you handled it back then. Did you have a joint bank account? Was your money <laughs> your money? Did you say, honey, our, your money is our money? <laughs> I would love to know how you handled it because I've been married twice, so obviously I didn't get it right. Obviously, I don't have it. <laughs> I, and I will get married again. So I want to ask, again, starting with Ruth Stack, and we'll go into rotation. How did you handle your family finances? Did you have a wifey fund, Ms. Shack? Uh, I must admit that we had a single bank account. It okay. was so minuscule. I mean, I used to say we were worth $37.50. I mean, we operated, my husband and I and our three daughters, one who is a Linda, spelled L-Y-N-D-A. Oh, Look at that. Uh, and we never had enough finances to get excited about. Oh. But after <laughs> I left the foundation, I, after I left the uh, commission, mm -hmm. I worked with the foundation. The now 25 my, years, uh, yeah. Uh, we had hundreds of millions of dollars that we were investing. So my message is women can be as smart or as dumb as the men in the field of, of finances. Okay, how about you, Mrs. Gibson? Did you I, have you a know, separate bank account? I was not one of the early married people. I was old when I got married. And so I always so you had, had your my, own money. I had my own checking account. And one of the things that my late husband said to me right away was, why, how much money do you need for me to run this house each month? And I said, well, you give me what you think you want me to have, but I mm -hmm. will always have my own checking account. Mm -hmm. And he knew okay. that I was gonna be helping my family. And he said, as long as you wanna keep your account, you keep it. He said, but I will give you whatever you need to run the house. Oh, but, uh, man. It was just one of those things that when money, 
back then Episcopal priest didn't make much money. <laughs> and I think I was making <laughs> as much money as he was. As he, okay, okay. And, and I con continued to work. Uh, okay. So that I always had um, help helping okay. family members and friends and that sort of thing. So I was And how about that. you, Dorothy, Dr. Dorothy Jenkins Field? Did you have your own? I, I have a feeling you had your own checking account. Am I wrong? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I want to plead the fifth on this one because I I want I I saw what was on TV and uh, with the families getting together and having meetings and um, uh, pooling their money and it just did not work uh, mm. as I had hoped that it would. Uh, I did not have my own account. In fact, I was a, I allowed someone to give me uh, money. Okay. Uh, yes. Yes, okay. <laughs> and, and, and I say that that doesn't work. Don't do that. Right, 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 right. <laughs> I learned the hard way. <laughs> you wouldn't advise your daughters to do that at all. Listen, one is an attorney and the other one is a professor of history at Carnegie Mellon. Oh, no. They <laughs> are on their own. They started off right. <laughs> they all learned right. from mom. <laughs> Ladies, thank you so, so much. You guys have dropped so much knowledge. Um, like I always say, we sit here and we say, oh, it's so hard and nobody, but to do what you did, again, I got to keep saying, under the conditions in which you did it in, second to none, second to none. And we thank you so much. You've made Miami part of the magic city and you brought a lot of magic into our city. And I, I tell everybody, if you don't know, you better Google them because these are history. You are history. Not only are we living history, you are history. And we love you and we thank you so, so very much. Well, I need to thank you. I, I need thank to you. thank I need to thank the chamber and especially my child. Uh, <laughs> most people don't realize that Eric Knoll is my son. <laughs> no, I didn't know that. <laughs> I go back to him when he was modeling at Bird Eyes, you know, when he was a modeler. And a lot of people don't know he's the model. But, uh, but he came and worked, he, he came to the Grove and worked with us. And he really did a great job with the children. And uh, so I always want to thank Mr. Knowles for all that you do for this community and for getting this little panel together today. Um, I am so grateful to yes. all of you and Ms. Harris. Uh, I know you. you're coming as chair. Uh, fortunately, I get to jealous every year and I, Mr. Woods, whose house we're in right now, mm -hmm. came with me to the dinner last year. Uh -huh. And we have a picture with Mr. Knowles. And, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, McDuck, uh, he was a uh, uh, McGee who was now on the county commission and one other mm -hmm. person was on that picture. But anyway, it's amazing. When I saw it in the paper this year that they had it, and it was virtual. I said, oh, so we didn't get a chance to get to the dinner this year. <laughs> Woods, well, my wife is here, Ms. Bernadine Barton, who's head of the Delta Gibson Health Initiative. And I just one, wanted to say thank you. The one thing I want to say is a couple of things I have to say before we close out. Okay. You know, when um, this opportunity came about and Baptists wanted to support uh, Black History Month, um, and I said, well, let's do uh, a Black Her story. And obviously I thought about my mother, Miss Gibson. And I thought about Dr. Dorothy Jenkins Fields. And then I said, and Ruth Shack. Oh, Ruth yeah. Shack needs to be mm -hmm. in, in this conversation mm -hmm. because she is a part of Black history. Yes, absolutely. And Black Her story. Mm -hmm. And I, I really did not know the depth of, of Ruth's, uh, uh, oh, I wouldn't say involvement, yeah, involvement. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so, you know, I, I, I often say things don't just happen because of happenstance. You know, I, I do believe things are, in, in, are done in divine order. Mm -hmm. So to have the three of you all here today to have this conversation is, is such a, a, a filling uh, feeling, heartfelt, Fill, a fulfillment of, of what you all continue to do. And I know Ruth, you moved to, to Georgia, but I know you still have your hands in, in what's happening down here. And, and, and the amazing things that 
Dr. Fields and, and, and Ms. Gibson continues to do. Um, you talk about the Thelma Gibson Health Initiative. You talk about the, the Black Archives and, and the Lyric Theater and the importance of all of that in our community. Um, as you said, Linda, we stand on their shoulders and so many others that uh, Dr. Fields mentioned. And I look forward to seeing that list. I look forward to this uh, conversation continuing. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to make this, uh, uh, I wish we could make it a monthly event. Um, I, wanna, <laughs> I wanna say an annual event, but we definitely have to keep this going. And, and thank you ladies so much. And also Dr. Johnson, I wanna thank you yes. uh, for mm -hmm. the, the kind words that you mm -hmm. brought and, and all that you're doing. I mean, again, we talk about d divine order, did not know that uh, you were uh, Thelma Gibson's I uh, doctor. <laughs> I mean, th these things don't just happen, you know? This, this, is, this is truly amazing. Every time and I most... hit the emergency room at the, at the time of my high school, I said, you know, my doctor's here, uh, Dr. Johnson. Now, she's not really my doctor, but I made her my doctor. <laughs> <Amazing>. <laughs> right? So, always and she would always come from somewhere. She, she's a busy young lady. Yes. But she would come from somewhere and say, oh, Thelma Gibson, he said, let's get her in this mm -hmm. room. And right. she'd get me in a room right away. And I knew that was really one of the things she was always good at. It's always good well, I claim Dr. both Dr. Fields and Ms. Gibson as family. So Yes, right? we are. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing I want to say is the three of you are have been doing what you've been doing and you continue to do mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's not something that you stepped away and say well you know give it to somebody else you you know there's so many of us that un need to understand that the work that that has to be done has to be done Right, right, right. But, but I'm not really doing that much now. You know, I'm one of those. I don't do Zoom. This is <laughs> as Barton didn't have this machine and Mr. Woods and Mr. Woods have me down here to use. I would not be on here. As I said, I've done, I always say I've, I've stepped aside and let the young people do what they want to do. And mm -hmm. I'm so proud of the young people and what they've been able to do with the Black Lives Matter. Yes. Uh, they have changed so many things. When I mm -hmm. think that there's no longer an Aunt Jemima on the pancakes mm. and the kinds of things. Mm. <laughs> it doesn't taste the same. <laughs> just just, just, the, just the, little, the, the, the little things that I watch happening uh, really makes me proud. And so wow. I'm willing to give over to young people. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had my day. I've done the best I could in that. Mm -hmm. uh, I still have a lot to do, I guess, yes. and I do as yes. I can. That's right. But yes. uh, I, I'm, I'm willing to let the young people take over. And that's why we have people like you, Ms. Harris and Mr. Knowles and yes. Dr. Johnson. Right. <laughs> We're doing a good job. Uh, Dr. Fields who's continuing to do her great work at the archives. And of course, Commissioner Shaq, our yes. former commissioner, <laughs> who did so much yes. for this community. Ever our commissioner. <laughs> yes. Please let me call these names. Helen okay. Miller, Mayor of Opelika, Helen Miller, Ruth Greenfield with the uh, uh, Conservatory in Overtown, Carol Ann Davis, Carol Ann Taylor, Betty Wright, and Bernadette Morrison, who is with the Chamber and who has come through, uh, who has done so much over the years. Dad, Dr. Dazel Simpson, Dr. Evelina Bessman, who has just retired. They're just Regina Jolivet Frazier. They're just so many women who have uh, individually and collectively um, helped make this community what it is and what it's going to be. Uh -huh. And then all the new young people who are coming in, uh, Anne McNeil, and then her daughter, who is uh, uh, the young billionaire. I mean, billionaire with a B. She's working, <laughs> she's had, she has her million. Now she's working on the next. I mean, it's exciting, as Thelma said, to be a part of what you're doing. And so I know we're over time, but uh, Dr. Johnson, uh, Yvonne Johnson, getting the, helping us, uh, the community with all that we're going through in this crisis. Uh, certainly I'm thinking about your mother-in-law and your, uh, all the people at the Church of the Incarnation uh, from Richmond Heights, uh, Lillian, uh, 
uh, are all smiling as we thank you uh, for your work. Professor Eric Knowles. Yes, ma'am. President, Chairman, CEO, you, you done it. You made it happen. Thank you. <laughs> well, well, I, again, I, I, am, I am thankful for Linda for um, moderating such a wonderful panel. Linda, yes. Yes. Where did was. you get her from? We didn't, oh, we Linda, don't know her. Hey, 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 well, hold on. Let me, I'll give you a little quick story. <laughs> Linda, Linda and I have been hanging out since 1717 Northeast 17th Avenue, and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> oh, oh, excuse me. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> well, well, you know, there was there was a club back in the day called Pier 17, and the address was 1717 Northeast 17th Avenue. So we 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 we've been joined at the hip for a long time. And I asked Linda to to be the chairwoman of, of the women's business council for, for for and when I asked her, because I knew of her take no prisoners attitude and <laughs> and and she has done a, an amazing job you and merlene have been i believe dr fields you've been to the uh, uh little black dress and pearls uh luncheon oh, yes yes and and it is an amazing luncheon that she brings speakers from all over the country and um and i i begged her to be on the board for many years. And she was like, no, Eric, I'm da, 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 da. and so finally I've gotten her on the board and she's the chair elect. She'll be the chairwoman in a couple of years. But I, my last words I wanna say is that, as I said, uh, we have named 2021 the year of the woman. And everything that we're gonna be doing this year is gonna be honoring and um, based around women. Um, and so you'll be hearing more and you will be engaged in that process. And I look forward to uh, honoring the three of you all and many others as we honor the women in our community. We thank you. Thank you. And, and, and I was just told by Ms. Barton that Ms. Shaq was the first person to give a donation to the Thelma Gibson Hill Oh, and, and that's so the I other thing. To, wow. Yeah, you know that well, Ms. Barton, you see, thank you, you for that. And the wow. other thing that I didn't say and you all three have been honored by the chamber yes, over the yes, years at yes, the gala. Yes. All three of you have been yes. honored as you have been honorees because of all the work that you continue yes. that you have done over the years. And I, I mean, I am I'm thrilled. I'm just I'm so thrilled. honored. Yeah, we're so great. Thank, thank, yes. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. all. Thank you, ladies. And, thank and, you. and I want to thank those who joined us today to to listen. And, and partake in this Her Story Month. Um, <laughs> it's going to be Her Story Month every year. <laughs> Moving forward. <laughs> All right. So, so, there's a question asking, where can they find the book, uh, Julia's Daughter? It's, a question it's, came in. Yes, it's well, in, uh, we put one in every, uh, one was put in every school library thanks to Ruth and the Knight Foundation. Wow. See, there's and, another connection. Uh, wow. Wow. You can also get them uh, at the public library. Okay. And you may be able to get one or two online at Amazon.com. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Ruth, you, I have a feeling you've been behind a lot of things that we don't know about. You mm -hmm. just. Thank I, you. I can say honestly, I have lived a charmed life. Wow. <laughs> In this way. And we'll do all the better for it. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all you. right. Have a great day, ladies. Right. And a great Thank evening. you so much. Have a good right. evening. Thank you.